Four of the country's largest child care providers are agreeing to offer their services for free to give parents and caregivers time to get vaccinated over the next month. The deal with the White House will allow no-cost drop-in care at more than 3,000 kinder care, learning care group, and YMCA sites nationwide. Many will also offer child care for people recovering from vaccinations. A lack of child care has been identified as a barrier for many who have not yet gotten COVID-19 shots. It's part of what the Biden administration is calling a national month of action. The president's goal is to get at least one dose in the arms of 70 percent of U.S. adults by July 4th. So far, about 63 percent of adults have gotten a shot, which means the country is roughly 18 million people away from the president's goal. Mr. Biden encouraged Americans to help reach it. We're asking the American people to help. We need you. We need you to get your friends, family, neighbors, and coworkers vaccinated. Help them find an appointment. Drive them to the site. Talk to them about why you made the choice for yourself. So many Americans have already stepped up to help get their communities vaccinated. And over the next month, we're going to need you more than ever. So please, do your part. Give it your all through July the 4th. Let's reach our 70 percent goal. Let's go into the summer freer and safer. Let's celebrate a truly historic Independence Day. Alex Tin joins me now. He's a CBS News reporter and has been covering the pandemic. Hi there, Alex. So I'm really curious personally to see how this free beer is going to work as an incentive and how many people decide to take folks up on that <laughs> offer. But besides the free beer, Alex, what is the government doing to encourage vaccinations? Well, as you mentioned, you know, really the idea that was rolled out today, the campaign, you might say, that was rolled out today in advance of that July 4th goal that the president has set out for vaccinations in the United States really falls into two buckets. One bucket are all these partnerships with private organizations and private companies doing everything from offering incentives, freebies, goodies, giveaways to get people incentivized to get their COVID-19 vaccine shots, as well as services, like you mentioned, those child care providers who are going to help kind of facilitate addressing one of the key drivers of what we've seen is not vaccine hesitancy, but the obstacles and hurdles that people have been facing as they plan or try to figure out how they can even get a COVID-19 vaccine shot. So that's one bucket. The other bucket of things that was announced today really is a bit of a callback to my days as a campaign reporter last year which is canvassing and phone banking and text banking and partnerships with all these hmm. grassroots organizations that are planning outreach to nudge people to get their COVID-19 vaccines, all the way to the vice president and other members of the cabinet themselves going out on the trail, stumping in the states throughout the United States, highlighting you know different ways that COVID-19 vaccinations have been working and energizing those volunteers that will hopefully, all together with the partnerships, with the federal programs, push the United States and that first dose goal over the 70 percent line by July 4th. Yeah, it really is, as you say, a campaign with all of those similarities that you just pointed out. But Alex, is there a way to measure if these specific incentives on the federal or state level are working? Is there a way to sort of tease out and separate for those people who do decide to get vaccinated, whether it was the incentives that pushed them to do so? Well, the short answer is no. You know, I don't want to overpromise here. Just like in political campaigns, too, you know, we have proxies, different ways that we can try to get at attempting to measure how much these incentives are working. You know, there was a survey out recently from the Kaiser Family Foundation. They've been doing a regular set of surveys for a while that was really asking these sets of people who haven't gotten their COVID 19 vaccine yet, well, why is it that you haven't gotten vaccinated? And what would convince you to get vaccinated? And what you saw in that recent survey was that small but not insignificant portions of the people who have yet to get a COVID-19 vaccine said, yeah, incentives would work, child care would work, all these different things to address obstacles as well as incentivize would work. So there is surveys. And obviously there's the big picture, which is we can look state by state, county by county, and all around the country to see how the COVID-19 vaccine rollout has been working over the past few months. And the short answer is it really has stalled out. You know, we saw that huge surge for months 
of COVID-19 vaccinations getting faster and faster and faster, more and more people every day on average getting their COVID-19 vaccine. And we saw a smaller blip recently that came after both, you know, the prominent lotteries that were announced by Ohio, the unmasking guidance that was announced for fully vaccinated people, and then obviously that whole slew of other things that came with it, even adolescents being able to get their COVID-19 vaccines. So all of those things together also saw a big spike in COVID-19 vaccinations, people getting their first doses, but even that has begun to fall. So yes, we can look at surveys to kind of tease out maybe how much all these little programs are working, but at the end of the day, we know that overall, the cadence has fallen, it's continuing to fall, and at this moment at least, it appears to be below what's needed to meet President Biden's goal of July 4th. Hmm. Well, when you look at the CDC's map of which states and territories are the most vaccinated, it's really interesting because there are huge gaps among the different states. Is there a concern about a disparity in vaccination across the country? Yes. You know, the CDC director, Rochelle Walensky, was actually asked about this very topic earlier today. She was speaking at a World Affairs Council of Atlanta virtual event. And, you know, they asked her about both the question of seasonality. You know, we know that respiratory diseases like the coronavirus, like the common cold, like the flu, all have this kind of seasonality that occurs where, especially in states that are very cold during the winters and people tend to be huddled indoors, that the winters tend to be the worst for respiratory diseases. And when things open up and people are spending more times outside versus inside, you really see the transmission occur less. And what the CDC director said was, look, that's not really my concern right now. I do think that overall in the United States, state by state, we are going to have a lot of people vaccinated, probably enough that we aren't worried about these national surges of COVID-19 cases, either in the summer or in the fall and winter when things start to get cold again. But what they are worried about are these pockets of the country. And we know there are these counties all throughout the United States that are far below even 50% of their residents getting just one dose of their COVID-19 vaccine. And it is in these places that there are people who could potentially get COVID-19, get hospitalized and die. And obviously that risk continues to grow as we face, you know, probably more concerning variants. For example, the B16172 variant that everyone is concerned about over in the United Kingdom that we know are spreading already here in the United States. And that's obviously a concern for public health officials as we enter this kind of final sprint to try to get more and more people vaccinated. All right, um, Alex, clearly you know your stuff because you can name these variants with all those numbers. They're going to change that, by the <laughs> well, way, right, they just Alex? Gave them the way that they do too, that? So. <laughs> Simplify it, right? Yeah, but I'm just curious, before we let you go, Alex, you're someone who obviously you follow this day in and day out. So what is it that you are going to be watching here as we begin to really kind of get into the summer weeks here moving forward? What are you keeping a really close eye on now? Well, there, there are probably a few things, some of it that we've already touched on, right? Some of it is that pace of vaccination, and it's going to become so hyper-local. You know, we're going to be hearing more and more stories mm -hmm. about these specific counties and specific parts of the country that are so far behind the rest of the country in terms of their COVID-19 vaccination rates, and probably all kinds of interesting and maybe even crazy ideas, both to incentivize people to get the vaccine, as well as to ease access issues. You know, and you're hearing some of that already with these very high-profile mobile efforts efforts, literally bringing the vaccine to people's doorsteps. So that's probably one big thing we're going to be following. And another one is obviously the variants. You know, we I talked a little bit about B1617 recently. Another really concerning one is P1. You know, CDC recently put out these updated what they call nowcast projections, and that comes with its own set of caveats, but they're called nowcast projections that estimate the prevalence of these concerning variants around the country. And one that has really seen an uptick in recent weeks has been the P1 variant that was first identified in Brazil. And that's obviously concerning for a number of reasons. Reinfections are part of it. And also it really has seen, uh, it has been able to defeat essentially the monoclonal antibodies from Eli Lilly that everyone was so hopeful about many months ago to the point where HHS, you know, that's the Department of Health and Human Services, has stopped distribution of that monoclonal antibody in so many parts of the country mm. because of concern of the P1 variant. So really, it's variants and it's vaccinations. It's a race between these two parts, and that's what we'll be following for these next few months. All right, Alex Tin, covering all angles of this story. I really appreciate it, Alex. Thank you. Thank you.